Colonia, how to set up and play. First thing you'll do is assemble the game board. Next, put all of the resource tokens inside of the draw bag. You have leather, iron, wood, linen, and fur. During the game, those resources are going to get converted into goods. So stack all of your goods tokens. You have saddles, cartwheels, painting brushes, clothing, and shoes. And also lay out the starting bar. Next, shuffle all of the ship tiles and randomly draw four to start the game and place them in the shipping berths and lay out the one bar here. Next, lay out the four currency types in the game. Put out the four stained glass window cards. These represent end game victory points for the players that have the most currency of the type at the end of the game. Shuffle all of the relic cards with this back and randomly deal 10 on this board to start the game. Shuffle the deck of edict cards and deal three here. These represent laws that will be voted on. And finally, for board setup, shuffle your Septimania or your weak cards and place the deck here. For each player, give them a screen to hide all of their assets. Give them their deck of family cards and their two voting cards. Each player will have a start token that will go over here. Next, give each player their starting family members. The number of starting family members based on the number of players. Since I'm setting this up for a three-player game, I'm giving players all 38 family members. But you can see they'd get 30 in a four-player game, 25 in a five-player game, and they'd only have 21 family members in a six-player game. Finally, players will start with five in each of the four currency types. They'll draw four random resources from the bag, and they'll start with one good based on a die roll. So this player rolled a two, so they took a cartwheel. The different goods correspond to this die number here. So that two gave the cartwheel up to a five. If you roll a six, just re-roll and take the good according to the die roll. Everything except your family members are hidden to other players and kept behind your screen. The family members are a supply that are visible to all players. So the game is gonna last six rounds or six weeks. And then within each week, you're going to have the seven days of the week, always starting with Monday. So the first thing you'll do is turn over the week card, and then you'll set up the game board based on the week. So we're going to put out a number of resources in the resource market. We're going to set the number of die that are going to be used in the goods area. And we're going to set the bars in the good area. And we're going to know how many ships are going to sail this week. So for this card, I've randomly drawn the number of resources indicated for each stall and have placed them out there. As we move over here, I've set aside four dice. If you only have one dice, you can just put one here. Just know that you're going to have to roll it four times when we get to this phase. I've set the goods bars based on the number. So I've moved this one for this first one three spots forward. So it started there. One two, three. This one came up one space. It went from one to there. And you can see two, one, zero. So this one went from one, two, one, and that one stayed in its starting space. Basically, this is indicating now that one, two, three goods can be produced, whereas only one good here, two goods here, one good there, and then for the time being, no goods are going to be produced there this week. And then the final thing for the week card, it indicates how many ships are going to set sail. So I've just put the bar here to indicate that these two ships will sail at the end of the week. One thing to remember, in the last round of the game, or the sixth round, we ignore that part of the setup. All ships will set sail in the last round of the game. And then the last thing you do as part of Monday is to reveal the top three edict cards. I set them out as part of setup, but three new ones would come out at the start of each week. Next is Tuesday. All players are going to simultaneously play and then reveal one of their unplayed family cards. 
These only get played once in the game. So once a player has played their six card or their five card, that's going to get removed from the game. And then you're going to take the number and place the number of family members into this area. So based on the cards played, the yellow player has six family members, the green player five, and the red player four. This will also set the relative turn order for the round. So yellow will go first, followed by green, and then red. Since yellow played the highest number, then green, then red. If on the first round, two players played the same value number, you would just have to roll the dice, and the higher number would go first. On subsequent rounds, if two players play the same value card, you would just reverse the turn order from the prior round for those players. This is now the new turn order for the rest of the week with the top player being considered the mayor. If a player does not have enough family members in their supply to actually place into the city hall spot, they are allowed to take from the street that were placed in the prior round or they can even take from the next street space. If there still aren't enough to satisfy the card, their card would actually just get flipped down and they're going to get counted as zero for all purposes this round. But after we've revealed and placed the workers, these are going to stay face up in front of each player for the duration of this week. It's also going to represent, in addition to setting the turn order, the number of votes they have on the edicts. So put these in front of each player. Then the final step of Tuesday is to return any family members that were in the street from the last round back to your supply. And then these all now get moved into the street space. So now these family members won't be available to the players again until at the end of Tuesday in the next week. Next we're ready to move to day three. I've actually added some family members here to see what this would normally look like once we're past the first week of the game. Keep in mind though that before we resolve days three, four, five, and six, we always check to see if there are any edicts that need to be voted on first. So if there are edicts for the given day, these will get voted on before we actually resolve the steps of the day. All players will simply, one edict at a time, play their vote cards face down, and then we'll all reveal them to see whether the edict passes or fails. So in this example, we just sum, sum the votes. So there were six votes in favor of the edict, but nine against the edict, so the edict would fail. If there's ever a tie, the current mayor would break the tie. So after resolving an edict, simply just remove it from the game. Either you would remove it without effect if it fails, or if it passes, you resolve the effects as listed on the card. So this would get resolved, then this one would get resolved, but here we can see this one isn't going to get resolved until the start of day six during this week. Then for Wednesday, in turn order, each player can take all of the resources from one stall and replace that exact number of resources with members of their family. So since yellow is the first player, if they want to take all of these resources, they would take all seven and put seven family members there. Green is next in turn order. They want, they want these four, so they'll put four family members there. And then red goes, let's say they want these three, so they'll put three family members there. This will keep going round and round until all players have passed. So now that all players have gone once, maybe the yellow player will go again and take all six of these and put six family members here. So that's what it might look like after everyone has passed. Any stalls where the resources weren't taken simply get returned to the bag. So you'll clear those off the board and then players will get the chance to take their family members that were in the street back to their personal supply. Then at that point, all the family members here will move to the street. So these players won't get these back until the end of Wednesday during the next week. Next is Thursday. Again, in player order, one at a time, players will get the opportunity to turn in resources for a good. To turn in resources, you simply turn in the indicated resources for the type of good and put family members in the available spot. You can see these dark shaded areas, one, two, three. So to place the first order for saddles, a player would turn in a dark brown and a black, 
and place one family member there. So the resources, once they're turned in, they go back into the bag. The family member goes on the spot, but you don't take the good yet. We're going to do that after everyone has placed all of their family members claiming goods. So green player is next in turn order. Let's say they place a family member there. They turn in their two resources. Those go back into the bag. It doesn't matter that the bar is here. You can still place family members on one of the available three spots. So let's say the red player is next and they also want to place an order for the shoes. They would turn in their resources and they would have to put two family members on this spot. Whenever the first family member is placed for a specific good during that week, it only requires one. Once the second order is placed, it requires two family members, and once the third order is placed for that good in that week, it requires three. So now we're back to yellow. They decide to place one there. They turn in the resources, go back to the bag, since it's the first one placed for this good during this week, it only takes one family member. So you're going to keep going around the table until all players have passed. It's okay to have multiple orders for the same good, but you still follow the normal rules. The second placement would take two family members. And then once all players have passed, you're now ready to roll the dice based on what the indicated week showed. So let's say this was the die roll. The die pips correspond to the good type. So since we rolled a one, this would move up one level, but we can see it's already at its maximum level, so that wouldn't move up. We rolled a two, so this would move up one level. Another two would roll it up again, move it up again. A six, you can see the goods only go up to five. A six means that every good will move up. So these are already at the maximum. The six would move that one up. It would move that one up to there and it would move this one up to there. So the die results are going to allow more goods to get produced by sliding the bars this way on the game board. Once you've adjusted all of the bars according to the die rolling, now players will now collect their goods. So you can see all family members kind of above the bar will be able to collect the goods. So the yellow player will get one, two of the saddles, Green would get one of the cartwheels, yellow would get one of the painting brushes, red would get a clothing, but you can see only here the green would get a shoe. The reds are on this side of the bar, so they don't get a good this week. Once players have collected their goods, they'll now take any of their family members in the street back to their supply, and then any family members on this side of the bar will get put into the street. So I've moved those here. Now the bars will reset to their starting position. And then any family members that didn't collect goods simply get slid up to the highest spot. So basically they're first in line now to get a shoe good during the next week. One thing that's important to remember, during the next week, the first placement here, even though there's two, remember the first placement for a good that week only requires one family member. And so if a player came here, two family members, since that would be the second placement, it doesn't matter how many family members were left over from the prior round. On day five, Friday, players in turn order will get the opportunity to return goods and place a family member on any empty cargo hold. So the yellow player is first. Let's say they decide to turn in these. These would just simply go back to their supply stacks and they want to fulfill the requirements for that empty cargo hold. So they would place one family member there. It doesn't matter how many goods you're turning in. It's always one family member, but now that cargo hold has been filled and no other player can select it. Let's say green player goes next. They decide to turn in two of the clothing. So they can put a family member there. Red goes next. They decide to maybe turn in one saddle to put a family member there. Let's say yellow goes next. They decide to turn in one paintbrush. So as long as there's an empty cargo and you have the goods to turn in, you keep going around in turn order until all players have passed. Once a player passes on their turn, it takes them out of the step. Once all players have passed, 
If you had any empty uh, any family members here on the street space, you can now return those to your supply, but those family members are going to stay there until we get to step six. That's when we're actually going to collect the revenue from supplying those goods. So on day six, Saturday, we're going to collect revenue for any ships that are setting sail. Those are the ones above this bar right here. You do it one ship at a time, starting in berth number one. So we can see that the yellow player is going to earn 2 plus 15, so 17 total currency of that specific type, since that's where the goods got shipped. So they would get 17 from the bank in that currency type. Once you've paid that player their currency, you can move their family members to the street space. The red player would get two in that currency. We can see this next ship is above the harbor bar. So the red player would get 15 in that currency and the green would get two in that currency. And you could return their family members to the street. And those are all the ships that are gonna set sail this week. So these ship tiles would simply get discarded and then these ships would move up on the board. So I've slid those up. You now draw any replacement ships for empty spots. These players did not get paid their revenue because those ships did not set sail. You don't get paid the revenue until the ship sets sail, but they retain their spots kind of blocking those cargo holds from other players and they will hopefully eventually get paid that revenue when these ships set sail. So again, as a reminder, during that last round of the game, round six, you don't even pay attention to where that marker is. All four of the ships in port will set sail and all players will get their revenue in that final round of the game. Day seven is Sunday. It's the last day of the week. In turn order, players will go around the table and they can buy one relic. They have to pay the cost in the specific type of currency for the card. So for example, to buy this one, it would cost five in the English or the London currency, whereas this one would cost 15 in this currency. Pay your currency to the bank, you get change, and then simply put this behind your player's screen. These will not get refilled until everyone has passed. The relics purchased represent end game victory points. So a player with this in their possession would have four victory points versus three victory points. One card that's different are these. These are doublers. So when a player purchases this card, this can stay face up in front of them and then they can make a decision. They can immediately pair. It has to match the currency type. They can pair something that matches with this card. You, like, you can only pair one card to this doubler and then that would be locked. And then at the end of the game, the card that was paired to it would be worth double victory points. So it's probably better to pair one of a higher value. So if this player had this one behind their screen, they could decide to pair it with this, and that would be worth six victory points at the end of the game. If they decide not to pair right away, this would stay in front of them. Um, and then when they acquired a new card, they could pair it. So immediately upon acquiring this, you could pair anything behind your player's screen or it would just stay in front of you until you acquired a new card that you wanted to pair with it. Just make sure it matches the currency type. So you'll keep going once a player passes, it knocks them out of the process. And then once all players have passed, before we actually refill the cards, players have a chance to safeguard a card for the next round because all these actually will get discarded at the end of this day unless they're safeguarded. So once all players have passed, we start with the start player and they decide if they want to safeguard any of these cards. Maybe they say they don't. Then we go to the next player and the green says, yes, I want to safeguard this card. So you just put one family member on it and you'll keep going around the table until players have decided that they're done safeguarding cards for the next round. Once all players are done, any cards that have not been safeguarded will simply get discarded from the game. Once you've completed that, uh, you refill the board now back up to 10 cards. These family members will stay on these cards until another player either buys the card or until the end of the game. Now this isn't reserving the card necessarily for the red player. So during the next week, if the green player or the yellow player wants to buy this relic and they can pay the currency type, 
they get to take it and the red player simply just gets their family member back. So you're just preventing the card from getting discarded. You're not necessarily reserving it for yourself. So now that we've refilled the display back up to 10 cards total, that ends day seven and that ends the entire week. Players will now discard their family member cards from the game. Those, can, those specific ones can't be used again. And now you're ready to start another week by flipping over the week card. You'll continue playing six total rounds or six weeks of the game. And at the end of the final round, the only other additional victory points available, the player with the most remaining money in each of the four currency types will earn the stained glass card, and that's worth two additional victory points. All players will tally their victory points from stained glass cards, relic cards, any paired relic cards that got doubled by placing on the double thing, most victory points will win the game. If there's a tie for most victory points, then it's most money, then most goods, then most resources to break ties. Finally, most of the edict cards are pretty self-explanatory. Here are a couple of ones I want to point out. So during day three, each merchant offers one more resource than specified. So you would just draw an additional cube out of the bag randomly on top of what was prescribed for the round. Here, uh, two foreign merchants arrive in the city, each offering four resources. So that's what these spaces are used. So just draw four cubes each randomly out of the bag. There is an edict like this for each of the five good types. Basically, here the saddler fulfills two additional contracts. Here, up to three family members for each player standing on the street field go home. And you look at the street field from the prior day. So if you enact this, Prior to day four, you could pull family members from the Wednesday street space. Likewise, if you enacted the one that has the five on it, you would look at day four street space to pull the family members. For this type of edict, it'll say one ship, or in this case, two ships leave the harbor immediately, and then revenues get paid. So you always go in the birth order. So for that one, these would get removed immediately these players would receive their revenue based on the currency type. Those family members would immediately go to the street, just like normal. These would get discarded. These would get shifted up. You'd draw two new ones. Keep in mind, these edicts are always resolved prior to the start of all the steps for that day. For this edict, it says one additional storage place is available on each ship, and it can be used for any kind of good. So you would treat this Kind of like your single cargo holds that are worth two revenue. So if the green player wanted to deliver any good to that ship, it can be any type they can turn in, I would just put the family member there and we know that's worth two revenue because they turned in one good and it can be of any type and they could pick any ship if that edict was enacted. Just keep in mind it only provides one additional storage place on each ship. Here in day six, two new relics from the pile are placed on the two additional places for relics. So that's what these spots are used for. And then finally, this one, next week each family deploys one family member less than specified on the card played. So when they play these cards, that'll still serve as their voting number. But if this was enacted, instead of having to put six family members onto that spot, they would only have to put five but they'd still retain the voting value of the card. And that should be everything you need to set up and play Colonia.